And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Aurelio Moraca. Um, I am the program uh, technology program coordinator here at the Danbury Library. And on behalf of the friends of the Danbury Library, I welcome you to this two-part uh, series called A Climate Story and uh, uh, with pre presented by Professor Wagner of Western Connecticut State University. And it is called From the Medieval Warm Period to the Little Ice Age, part one. So uh, thank you uh, uh, everyone for joining us on this uh, um, cold November afternoon. And uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Wagner, you have the con, sir. Hello everyone. Um... I always enjoy speaking to uh, this group and, and all groups. Um, I This is my third, if I seem a little tired, this is my third climate talk today. I started off in uh, talking to the University of Ottawa in Canada this morning. Um, so I think I'll, I have enough energy to work to finish up and finish strong here. All right, so, um, I am an ecologist, but ecology is a exceptionally interdisciplinary field. It's not just one thing. It's not just looking at DNA in in bacteria or all which is worthy, but it's it's not that. It's it is looking at interactions between different systems. And one of the systems that is often left off ecology because perhaps the scientists don't haven't taken the courses is history and climate climate change the industrial revolution and all that stuff is in, intensely interdisciplinary and it includes all the human activities going back to mitochondrial eve and this includes things that have happened more recently that are either um, agents of climate change or responses to it. Okay, so I'm, I'll, I'll be starting off then. There is a particular, you know, sci uh, scientists, humans are kind of like stamp collectors. We like to categorize things and put it in bins so that we can understand it. And one of the historical bins, which is um, used to talk about things that happen in the North Atlantic region is something called medieval warm period. Okay. It was a time in Earth's history um, not so long ago that it was very warm in the North Atlantic and Southern Greenland and Eurasian Arctic and parts of North America. It wasn't warm everywhere, but it did influence and affect humans in profound ways and in some ways that have made it all the way to our, our fairy stories. Medieval warm period, despite the name was cool in Central Eurasia, Northwestern North America and parts of South America. So it was, it was <clears throat> part of the natural variation of the world. We had not yet started mucking around with, with things um, very much. And so humans still at this point were respond, we were uh, reacting to the weather and not uh, causing it. And so there was a time in around 12 AD, um, which was called the little warm period, which caused humans to colonize areas like Greenland, which they had not done so before. And it was followed by the Little Ice Age, which we'll talk about uh, later on, um, that is also related to the Black Death and uh, lots of other, other uh, amazing type stories. But as you can see, it is uh, something that is um, most profoundly measured in the English speaking old, uh, part of the world. And so, um, Maybe not everyone talks about it the same way. All right, let's see. So if we look at the last 2000 some odd years, we can find on a global scale 
the Little Ice Age, we have a hard time locating the medieval warm period because it was a local effect and not something that would have been uh, shown up in all of the ways that we study climate from way back. Well, <clears throat> Let's start off with the Vikings. By the way, Viking, the term Viking is, is a verb, not a noun. Vikings is something the Norse did. They were the Norse. Um, and they were found, they appeared as a civilization in just where you expect them to, Scandinavia and Denmark. And they uh, wandered around a bit about this time and ended up in all sorts of places, including Russia. In fact, the, the first Russian czar was a Varangian, I think. He was a Viking that founded a Viking um, outpost on, the, on, the, on, on the, the river there. And, and that, was the, that was the center of the first Russian kingdom. Anyway, so the... Norse um, starting in Scandinavia and ended up all sorts of places. You can see the them showing up and interacting with the Finns and the Sami and the French, and uh, they made it all the way to Constantinople and colonized some areas of the Mediterranean uh, into northern Africa. The reason they were able to do this is because it was a particularly warm time in Earth's history, in Europe's history, and they had the technology to sail all over the place. Their boat was, their longship was a, um, the height of technology for the time. They were explorers, they were warriors, they were merchants, they were pirates. Uh, they did not wear hats with cow horns on them. That was something that was invented for the Wagner's operas. Um, <clears throat> and so it, when you see Elmer Fudd singing Kill the Wabbit, which is, is a classic, um, classic cartoon from the 50s, the 60s, or whenever it was, um, of, you know, of singing Wagner, it's, it is just showbiz. They used their long ships to, re to reach the Volga River and Constantinople and Sicily and North Africa and Newfoundland in the West. And that's part of our story. These long ships were long and skinny. They could be rowed. They could move under sail. They could be dragged by the sailors up on the beach. And they often had a masthead that would or or the 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 uh, the, the animal the, the dragon that would um, would be intended I think to cause fear and they did uh, and they, the Norse kept these boats because they were so practical on into the um, the Norman conquest and all sorts of stuff because the Normans even though they spoke French at this point were also Norse. <clears throat> and so they were able to sail all over the place. Now, speaking of the uh, Norman conquest, there was a, um, a tapestry that was, was constructed to illustrate some of the characters and the events of that of that Norman conquest of the Normans invading England and, and Harold Hundrada and, and the whole, and William the Conqueror and all that sort of stuff. And it's useful for our story because look at the boats. The boats the Normans were sailing were in fact the, the, um, the Viking longships with the little, little dragon heads and all. very clear what they were and no one else other than the um the vikings you know the norse had these and used them as extensively as they did this also um this was the battle of hastings in 
or whatever year it was, 10 something or other. Um, but there were a number of other battles where the Normans would conquer part of Saxon, uh, Saxon England, Wallingford and London and, and, and so on. William the Conqueror was crowned in this, on Christmas Day in London uh, during the midst, at the, toward the end of all this uh, battling. And interestingly enough, uh, what should happen at the same time that the Normans were invading England, but the, um, the comet made its um, periodic return, Halley's Comet. And here it is um, de depicted on the, on the, um, on the tapestry, as was Harold after he had surrendered to the Normans. Okay, so the Vikings, <clears throat> small groups of them anyway, um, took off and previous and previous to this had in had colonized a variety of things a lot harder to get to than England was from coastal France, um, Iceland. Iceland was uh, banished, was, was colonized by um, Eric the Red, or Eric the Red's father, I think, who was, um, had a little bit of anger issues and killed someone back in Norway and was given the choice of execution or banishment. And he chose banishment and he made his way to Iceland, which at the which is a, a remarkably green place or some place that's called Iceland. And um, then the family uh, continued west for a while um, over the decades. So Eric the Red, exiled from Norway due to manslaughter, quote unquote, moved to Iceland, exiled from Iceland for murders. There seemed to be a lot of that going around in their family. In 982, Eric moves to a strange island to the west, which he called Greenland, even though it wasn't all that green. And um, I think that was marketing. I think that was his effort, sent the word back to Iceland, come see and colonize and move to this green land I found. Because much of Iceland looks like this and is Arctic uh, and, semi and, and subarctic uh, fjords and and glacial terminuses and and things like that however there are two small areas in greenland at that time were more like this and they were the sites of two norse colonies that were um that were founded during this medieval warm period when the plants were available and the conditions were appropriate for a more or less typical Norwegian and Norse uh, life, you know, life uh, style, which meant dairy cattle and fishing and a combination of things. There were cattle that were, um, were used for, were grown in these a couple of, of uh, extended valley areas in the south of Greenland and the southwest of Greenland. And they were the Ulsterbygd and the Vesterbygd. And I, and I cannot vouch for my pronunciation of, the, of Old Norse. Vesterbygd is the site of where Nuuk, uh, the current national capital of the independent nation of Greenland is now. And that uh, area during the colonial Viking days contained a whole bunch of farmsteads. Each one of these red squares is a area where during that medieval warm period, these, these Norse families were able to make a living. And the, the southern colony was quite a bit smaller, but it, it was also thriving. And the Norse were here in, in Greenland for hundreds of years. They were not, you know, um, just explorers that didn't last the, you know, didn't last long. They were here for a long time. The typical the typical Greenlanders, um, Norse, um, 
house was made of sod because at the time there wasn't much in the way of trees to be found and all the wood had to be imported. And, um, and so sod was what you would, could make those houses out of. And this is a recreation of one of those, those old Norse houses in a, a, a museum area in Greenland. Okay, this, I don't know what happened to that previous slide. This is the, um, the most significant um, extant um, building from the Norse time. It was a church missing a roof now, but it was a stone church that at one point at least had a, a stained glass, glass window. Eric the Red's wife apparently was instrumental in bringing uh, Christianity to Greenland um, who, um, you know, but I'm not sure that Eric ever, ever converted. So the colony maxed out at two to 4,000 North settlers in 1126. By the way, in the Northern part of the, 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 um, the island, there were natives, they were indigenous folks, which we would identify as Inuit um, now. And they are, you know, the relative, the ancestors of, of people who live there to this day. And the colony lasted for about 5,000 years, or 500 years, pardon me. Now, <clears throat> Leif Erikson, Eric the Red's son, as one might guess, um, was the leader after uh, Leif, or after Eric passed on, and he was considered quite the quite the imposing figure. There are statues built to him, and honest to God, there is a a action figure. He has his own action figure, his own Lego action figure, Eric the Red. So there you are. You know he's important because of that. Well, Eric met up with a um, a Norse sailing captain named Bjarni Hurjofsson which is my favorite Norse name uh, because it's fun to say. And Bjarni was blown off course on a trip from Norway to Iceland. He found a new land he called Vinland because there seemed to be grapes growing there, wild grapes. He didn't stay, but he drew a map. And that map is quite famous now. It is. It contained every bit of the world that Bjarni had uh, any knowledge of, and even if the knowledge was was um, indirect, and, and including you know included uh, Western Europe, but it also included North Africa, it included Japan and China, but it also included to the west of Greenland this area, mysterious land called Vinland. Now this was all happening because the weather patterns for these few centuries were conducive to the, the, the Norse taking their boats and sailing, you know, long distances. So Leif Erikson was Eric the Red's son. He's born in Iceland in 970, went to Greenland with Eric. He bought Bjarni's boat and map and set off to find Greenland. He found Newfoundland what we call Newfoundland now. It, he established a Norse colony at Lanso Meadows, and the colony survived for somewhere between three and ten years. The Norse could not, did not get along with the natives, the indigenous folks who they call Skralings, which is a Norse name, I believe, that means wretches. And um, I think the Skralings probably didn't care for the Norse's attitudes, and it was probably a mutual loathing, and the Norse left after just a few years, but they left behind a site which archaeologists uh, have been able to find, and it's at the tip of, of, uh, of Newfoundland here. And this is a recreation of the Norse buildings at the site that the Canadian archaeologists have, um, have been able to put together they know the Norse were there because they found a iron forge technology, which no one else but the Norse in North America had at the time. 
and uh, Norse coins, which had been traded, were found as far south as, as the Hudson River. But they didn't stay around very long. So the medieval warm period was just a temporary aberration. It was, but it allowed longer and more productive growing seasons in Europe. Production wasn't, agriculture production wasn't all that high um, because, you know, there wasn't, a, you know, a research in agronomy and all these sorts of things, which gives us a leg up on growing, you know, plenty of food now. Uh, <clears throat> at the time, there were, um, there was enough food, and so lots of people didn't starve to death, and so the population in your medieval Europe had grown to the point where people were moving into the wildernesses, chopping down trees to um, build farmsteads and turn marshes into cleared land for, for agriculture, and this was at the time called the Great Clearances, and so uh, large amounts of forests were cut down and turned into into forests and into, into farmers' fields. Um, and during this same time, you had the end of the raids by Vikings and Arabs and Magyars, Magyars being the Hungarians that were horse people in the Central Asia at the time. And um, this allowed a certain degree of political stability. Land was plentiful while the labor to work, it was scarce. Urban centers emerged and over time the human population grew. Now we have a concept in population ecology uh, of a population that grows to a point where it reaches the maximum size that the given environment will support. And this works with you know, rabbits, it works with bacteria in petri dishes, and there's some evidence that it works with humans too under certain circumstances. And that seems to be what happened. The population grew because of the good weather conditions and everyone having enough to eat and children weren't dying of starvation and they reached the caring capacity of the local environment. By 1086, the population of England was a million. By 1300, it was five to seven million. France, which was geographically smaller than modern France, um, was 18 to 20 million population, a number that was not reached again for several hundred years. In Europe overall, in 1300, had seven to 100 million people quite a large population for given the technology of the time. By the year 1300, people had too many people and not enough grain production. The wheat yields were at best seven to one. And what this means is for every grain of wheat put in the ground to grow next year's that, that year's crop, they produced, for each grain of seed, you get seven grains of, of wheat back. That isn't very much, okay? And so the amount of food being grown toward the end of this, when the weather was cooling, again, um, was, was declining. Modern agriculture is uh, 200 to one ratio seed to harvest to seed to give you some sort of comparison. And then the 14th century, 1300s, was a major bummer in Europe in a variety, for a variety of reasons. Um, we have literate populations who wrote poetry, at least some of them did. Um, this was a poem on the evil times of Edward II, written around 1321. When God saw the world was so overproud, he sent a dearth on earth and made it full hard. A bu bushel of wheat was at four shillings or more, of which men might have had a quarter before. And then they turned pale, who had laughed so loud, and they became all docile, who before were so proud. A man's heart might bleed, for to hear the cry of poor men who called out, Alas, for hunger I die. So the good times of the medieval warm period became somewhat less good times and gradually less to left 
um, led to um, a, a very um, poor time for food to call the Great Famine. We have echoes of that in folklore, which we'll get to in a minute. This was restricted to Northern Europe, okay, not Southern Europe. Since 1280, the yield ratio of the weed had been falling in good weather was seven to one and bad weather was two to one. Imagine uh, counting or planting one seed of wheat and only getting two seeds back as your, uh, as your, um, and as your harvest and having to save one of them to plant the next year. That's what's called seed corn. In 1310 to 1330, there was a sustained period of bad weather, cold winters, rainy and cold summers. In the spring of 1350, there were heavy rains, summer cold and wet, grain could, couldn't ripen. It was too wet and cold and there was no fodder for the livestock and people ate roots, grass, and bark during the Great Famine. Draft animals were slaughtered for food. Seed grain was eaten. When you're so hungry, you eat your seed grain. You don't have anything to plot the next year, so the next year is even worse. Children were taken out and abandoned to fend for themselves in the woods. Do you remember that um, those all those gruesome fairy tales, the Grimm's fairy tales we heard as children, including Hansel and Gretel? whose parents in the story took them out and left them in the woods to fend for themselves. Well, that story may not have occurred exactly, but you know, that sort of thing really did happen. And there was cannibalism when people are starving, all sorts of stuff happens. And so you'll remember Hansel and Gretel, two small children that were left in the woods and they ran and found a, a a, a witch who uh, was trying to eat them and they finally pushed her in the oven and cooked her instead. Okay, that story then is an echo of the great famine of the 14th century in Europe. And people during this time were weakened by pneumonia, bronchitis, tuberculosis, and they were in bad shape some years later when the black plague came to make a visit. That's something we'll talk about next week. So the Black Death killed more people, but for many, the Great Famine was even worse, worse suffering. And to top it all off, a volcano in Indonesia called Mount Pinatubo, or maybe it's Philippines. I may have that wrong, but it's, a, it's one of the major volcanoes in Asia erupted, putting a bunch of, of um, dust in the air, which further cooled the climate temporarily. And then the Black Death came along, a pandemic, which was in fact a zoonosis, like uh, the pandemic we've had most recently. A zoonosis is a disease that jumps from one species to the other. In this case, the species are an, a black rat and humans and probably some other mammals as well. Um, it was an epidemic across a large area, starting in China or Central Asia. We're not quite sure. We're not quite sure whether it came uh, from Asia to Europe via trading ships of the Genoese and the Venetians, who were the trading powers at the time, or whether it came via the Silk Road on, on caravans or both. But came, it did, and the Black Death uh, showed up in uh, around Lake Baikal and eventually uh, Samarkand, which is now Uzbekistan, I believe, and found its way to, to Baghdad and then to Mecca in 1349, but it also found its way to India around that same time. And so chances are it spread both ways, both by ship and by by uh, caravan. It was introduced to the Crimea, which is a peninsula in the northern shore of the Black Sea by the Mongol army, which was laying siege to a city called Katha. The Mongols were afflicted with a, with a plague and they had some corpses of their own that had died 
of the plague, and they catapulted them over the walls of the city in an early example of bacteriological warfare. It worked. Kaffa, you can see here in the Black Sea. Um, and from there, from Kaffa, the Genoese and the Venetians did send ships to trade in those cities through Constantinople. And when a ship would tie up on a dock, the housers, the, the ropes that would attach it to the, the dock would become a tightrope through which uh, both directions rats would move. They would move from the ship to the shore and from the shore to the ship. And they carried the, um, they carried the fleas that contained the pathogen, um, which then were spread from, from city to, to city by, by the, uh, the trading, uh, trading boats. The pathogen itself is a bacteria called Yersinia pestris. It does not generally glow in the dark. It was treated with a fluorescent dye uh, so that a picture could be taken of it. It caused two different diseases, one of which was the bubonic plague, where, which caused these big black lumps on people's bodies where the lymph nodes were swollen and also pneumonic plague, which was uh, when, the, when the bacteria got into the lungs of the victim and the victim coughed on another person and spread the, the disease that way. Um, that's the way people died the fastest from pneumonic plague rather than bubonic plague. The plague was carried on rats in the belly of fleas and a flea would jump off one rat and then bite the next warm body it found, which was often a human. <clears throat> so bubonic, here's what I just said. Infection of the lymph nodes carried by rats spread by flea bite, pneumonic plague, infection of the lungs spread by coughing. There are a number of photos, or not photos, drawings from the time that showed plague sufferers and the doctors who were trying to treat them. Of course, the doctors didn't even know the bacteria existed at this point, so they had no real way of, tra of tracing it and studying the epidemiology. And so they, at best, could do palliative care. But they noticed that the, um, the uh, plague sufferers tend to smell really bad. And so they would put they made themselves lovely masks like this plague doctor mask. And the point of its bird beak was as an area where they could put flowers so that the perfume of the flowers would help them be able to survive the, the stink of the plague sufferer. At least that's the story I've heard. And I just happened to have a plague Dr. Mask, which I got during our recent play, just as fun. That's <laughs> what counts as fun. Well, anyway, um, the Black Death hit in the 14th century in various parts of Europe. There were notable areas that did not have any Black, Black Death deaths, okay? To the east of Nuremberg and a few other spots, okay? England was affected less. Um, London being affected the most of that of, of England, and, but uh, England didn't suffer as much as, as Italy did. 75 to 200,000 million, 75 to 200 million people died from the plague in the 14th century. A plague that they had no idea how to treat or anything. Europe lost 45 to 50 percent of its population during a four-year period. Along the Mediterranean, 75 to 80 percent mortality. Germany and England, far less, 20 percent. And the Middle East lost roughly 33,000. It's difficult to get accurate numbers about this. This is just our best estimate. And then as the plague was, was running its course, um, a few decades later, started the Renaissance. 
and Leonardo da Vinci, born in 1452. So that's my story for tonight. Coming up next week, we'll go through the uh, great dying in the, in the new world that where Native Americans in large numbers died from contact with European diseases they had no um, they had no immunity to, and the Little Ice Age and the Year Without Summer and Frankenstein to Modern Prometheus and the Industrial Revolution and Luddites. I'm going to explain where the term Luddite come from. <laughs> came from. Okay, we got, we got some questions. Um, okay, please. Okay, um, and also, if uh, folks, if you have questions, please put it into the chat, and uh, I'll relay it to uh, oh. uh, Dr. Okay. Wagner. So one of them was, what is, if as a verb, what does Viking mean? I think some Yeah, of, that's one of them, yeah. I think, I think it's ro a raider, perhaps, oh, or okay. someone who, who, um, you know, I think it ha it has to do with raiding because when I understand that these these Norsemen would do their you know they would uh, take care of their crops and their fields and their livestock and all that stuff during the summer, and then in the winter they would go a Viking, a raiding to support their income by harassing the the. Uh, the Irish uh, monks along the, the coast and stealing their candlesticks and all that. Yeah. That's my understanding. Um, question from Alex, how would they heat their homes in Greenland? Probably um, with, with uh, burning uh, dried sod or turf. What are the, what are the, that Irish, the Irish you uh, would, but, and still do burn, um, the swampy, uh, dried swamp, um, dead plants from swamps, and they dry it out and cut it up into squares and burn it. And you don't get a lot of heat, but you get some. There's a term for that. I just, it's not in my head at the moment. Okay. I suspect that's it because there wasn't any wood to, to burn and there wasn't, they didn't know about coal and all that kind of stuff yet. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it was really cold. <laughs> These are Norwegians, so maybe they uh, they knew how to to insulate with uh, with uh, you know they would go they would go hunting up along the coast and and kill seals and walruses and things like that. So they would have those skins that they could they could use for for um, for clothing. Another question, uh, how did the Inu Inuit get, get to, Greenland? to Greenland? Well, uh, during the winter, they, they had the technology of excellent boats. Um, you know, uh, the, uh, the Inuit in, in Alaska use a, a hide boat when they go whaling, which they're allowed to do in small, in small amounts as a traditional, traditional practice. And so using a seal skin um, it treated in certain ways, I understand, is more or less waterproof. And so you can make the kayaks and boats of various kinds that way. Uh, but also remember that that area is, is uh, sea ice is frozen long periods of time. So and over the course of the year, so they could probably walk there. Another question, why are some areas not affected by the, uh, the plague? Plague? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, dumb luck, maybe a plague, uh, carrier never went to those areas. And so they didn't cough or bring their fleas in. I, I don't know if there's any scientific reason uh, other than that, just pure dumb luck, but I don't know. Gotcha. Okay. Any other questions before we, uh, end for this evening? Uh, because uh, don't forget uh, to register for next week. Um, next Wednesday is uh, part two of the climate story. And um, I guess there's no more questions. So uh, we'll just call it an evening. And thank you, uh, Mitch, for again, uh, sharing your expertise and your knowledge with us on part one of a climate story. And until uh, next week, I'll, I'll see you all then.
Okay. So uh, until then, have a great evening. Bye.